Innovation is great, and how great it is indeed. We can have an appetizer from Dr. Michael Landesborough, who will introduce us all these innovative stuffs around the room. So, Dr. Landesborough, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I wish you a, a very pleasant early afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Michael Lonsborough, and I am what stands between you and a well-deserved lunch. So that puts me in a rather precarious situation. However, I hope what I have to say will be of at least some info interest to you all. I am a, a British scientist, I'm a research chemist, and I have a laboratory uh, just outside of Prague. I'm interested in a rather smelly group of uh, inorganic compounds called the boron hydrides, and I, and I innovate. I, I'm an innovator. I try to find new ways. I make new molecules. There was a, a nice talk about new molecules. I make new molecules, and I try to find new ways in how to use these new molecules. And so I've had projects in the semiconductor space, in the, the modification of surfaces, and most recently in the interaction of these molecules with light and the development of new laser materials. So innovation is certainly a very relevant word for me. I, I, I certainly can feel the, the tap of innovation on my shoulder, which is a pressure for me to, to, you know, to, to engender new work. Innovation for me, of course, and what we found out this morning certainly, uh, isn't just a, a eureka moment for a scientist. It's certainly it's a process. A process that demands uh, structures and institutions that cover governments, that cover society, educational institutions, uh, uh, private money, public money. And I think we've uh, heard some extremely important uh, contributions which highlight uh, this need for a, a well-functioning, a well-oiled uh, process. And it's been a delight to, to, to see how and to hear uh, firsthand how this oiling of this machinery is certainly beginning to rise in, the, in, in Hungary and it was a, a pleasure to listen to my two colleagues who spoke previous to, to myself that the fruits of this machinery is now bearing and with these uh, incredibly new uh, uh, innovative new companies. However, it's my uh, task to you to, to talk a bit about the well-oiled innovative machine that's coming from the British Isles. Uh, uh, where I am, of course, uh, originally from. And um, so that allows me to talk about some of what you see around you now, this uh, wonderful innovation showcase, which when we were originally putting together, of course, as one tends to do nowadays, when you consult the, the major arbiter of wisdom for today's era, of course, you Google things. And when we Googled uh, British innovation, uh, then we came across um, we came across this uh, site. That was the first hit. If you Google British innovation, you come to a uh, a site, a website which is funded by the uh, the institutions there at the bottom, and they talked about a, a great British innovation vote, which was rather interesting. It's an online uh, it's an online voting system where anybody can write in and, and vote for what they believe is the the most important, historically the most important British innovation and the most important modern British innovation. And it might not come as much a surprise that the, by far the, 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 the clear winner of the historically the most important British innovation was an innovation by this gentleman here, Alan Turing, and that's the universal machine, which laid the, was the forebearer for today's uh, modern computers, uh, iPads, uh, iPhones and, and anything that's computational, of course. And so it seemed reasonable to begin, I think, the showcase with what's actually innovating in this space. And of course, we hear a lot about the top end of the innovation in the computers, which are getting more powerful and also, of course, more expensive in many respects. What's, in it, what's interesting, though, is that innovation doesn't have to be just one way. You could innovate in, in one regard, downwards, certainly in price. And here's a fantastic little innovation that uh, we'd like to mention. You can, you can visit it over there. It's called the Raspberry Pi. Now, the Raspberry Pi comes in a box like this. 
which actually looks like a pharmaceutical sort of drug type box. So this is, in, indeed, it's the cheapest uh, computer which you can, you can buy. Here's what it looks like. It's only, it's a little thing like this. You, you can connect it to any display unit. We've connected it here to the uh, television screen. And it's any keyboard, and you've got a power source, and you're away, and you can start to compute. It costs only $26, uh, dollars, and it's become somewhat of a, uh, a, a very, you know, it's trending, as it were. It's, uh, it was developed by these gentlemen who are professors from uh, Cambridge University. And uh, they're charged with uh, expert sort of um, education of our young and up-and-coming IT, uh, uh, IT students. And they noticed a trend in recent years that whereas previously their students coming to Cambridge University were rather well versed with at least simple programming, in recent years where the interface become more touch screen, just a single button, you know, a lot easier to use, they found that the students coming to university had a big experience in, for example, creating web pages, but not so much in actual programming. And that rather worried them. So they wanted to reintroduce right to the bottom, to the core, an, an opportunity for young people in particular, but not exclusively, as we will soon see, to get used to doing more programming. And uh, so they came up with this conception of the Raspberry Pi, which took off. And if I come out of this presentation just very briefly, and if I look on the, the internet here, where's the internet, could you? Yeah, there we are. Okay, if you go to, yes. Click there. Here's, here's a global map, right? And this shows you, this is, this is all the time uh, changing, although it looks a bit frozen now. Uh, these are all the people who are using their Raspberry Pi at this moment. Okay, so it's taken over. It's a global thing now. Lots of people are using their Raspberry Pis to do some programming. And in that, I think there's a little bit of genius in this particular innovation of a very cheap computer. It's allowing... It's allowing spin-off uh, innovations to occur all over the world by anybody. It's sort of it's democratizing innovation, as it were, in the computer space. If we can go back to the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation, please. So, and innovating using the Raspberry Pi, they call it often the, you know, this, this society of, of Raspberry Pi users, or Piers, as they call themselves, they, they call them uh, Pi builds. And I'd like to show you some of my favorite little pie builds. Uh, so here's one. You'll be all familiar with the ISS, the International Space Station. Excuse me. The International Space Station is orbiting our planet, of course, and there's some fantastic science work going on there. And uh, one innovative uh, chap, young man, he came up with a, a way of recognizing when that space station is directly above your head. Using his Raspberry Pi, he programmed a system for, for it to be, once the, when this detection occurs, he gets a little beep on his telephone, which informs him that at that precise moment, directly above his head, where he is standing, there is the ISS. Which, of course, is rather nice, and you can just be, you can imagine yourself, you could be anywhere in the world enjoying a, an evening meal or taking a run somewhere or, I don't know, having a, I, I, you know, being somewhere, and all of a sudden a little beep goes, and you know at that precise moment that the ISS is above your head. Uh, other things I found, these, of course, the Raspberry Pi's are rather, uh, you know, they're proficient at using social media to, 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 to talk about their, their Pi builds. There's a, one a group of uh, group of chaps who are working at a, a forklift, well, a big company where they had all these big boxes and they were using forklifts to, to do a lot of transferring these boxes and they used their Raspberry Pi actually to get a control system to automatically use some of their forklift trucks. And you can see there how they're taking it easier and using this innovation to innovate their own working practices to uh, make it a bit easier for themselves. This is a rather uh, humorous example of another innovation uh, by a, um, a young man from New York who's a big dog lover and he's uh, also having to travel quite a lot and he set up his Raspberry Pi in, in, in conjunction with a, a dog food dispersal 
uh, uh, instrument, uh, which he attached also a camera and a microphone. And uh, with his Raspberry Pi, he can link it all in so that he, wherever he is in the world, at the touch of a button, he can dispense some food to his hungry hound and watch him eat. Or even take a photo of him eating and send it to himself, for example. So, which is a rather nice, again, it's, I, I like this idea of this sort of democratization of innovation thanks to this Raspberry Pi. Um, it's not all good fun, of course, it's also there, there are some more serious, sophisticated uh, innovations using this core innovation, and that's, for example, these Raspberry clusters, supercomputer. I mean, uh, I'm sure speaking for many, many of us who work in technological fields, I'm a chemist, we've, uh, over the last few years, the, the use of computational uh, chemistry has really come, uh, is a very profound element of our of my own research at the moment, and people are beginning to realize that you can cluster these individual Raspberry Pis, $26 a piece, and you can form a rather powerful computer through these clusters, which are capable of, of decent high-level calculations and computations. So there's also people who are adding s layers of sophistication, which might have even been outside the, you know, the, the thinking of the original innovation by these professors from Cambridge uh, University. Moving on, uh, if I as a scientist had to select two key innovations by the, the human species throughout time, I think the first was the ability to uh, control fire, the discovery as it were of fire, and, and the second is then the use, which is essentially the, the, transfer, the transformation of chemical energy into heat energy. And then the second key innovation was how to use the heat energy to get motion, to get movement energy. And before any of this thinking, of course, the, 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 the conversion of heat energy into, into transportation, into, we were very much dependent on very simple uh, ma uh, you know, co collaboration with animals to get around. But eventually we began to get able to use heat energy to propel ourselves forward. And this uh, innovation sort of uh, jumping from uh, this development, a lot of it happened actually in Britain. This is the jet engine, of course, which did. And now I'd like to introduce to you the latest innovation in this, in this uh, idea of propulsion, the, the conversion of heat energy into movement energy, and that's this Sabre engine. Now, uh, the Sabre engine was uh, developed by this gentleman here, Alan, Alan Bond, uh, working, of course, in, in Britain. And it's, uh, it's particularly good at... Uh, concentrating uh, oxygen from the air to add to its fuel, uh, fuel burn to really get a lot more uh, output of energy for, for, for your burn. And uh, this is particularly difficult to do because you've got the air coming in at, at, uh, at all sorts of different um, pressures, so the, uh, the actual technology is rather impressive. And the results are fantastic, and one of the things they're actually doing with it now uh, is to uh, spin off other projects based on this new engine type. And here's one, this is called the Skylon. I, I, I'll, lift it up, I'll lift it up very carefully for you. Last time, and I think in Buda, Bucharest, we actually broke a wheel, or somebody broke a wheel, so I've got to be very careful. Now, the, the Sabre engine is, is, going to be, is going to enable speeds of Mark V. You're going to be able to go five times the speed of sound. Now, to give you some sort of uh, contextual basis to understand this, this would mean that you could fly from Budapest uh, to Sydney within about four hours. So all if, with the use of such innovative technology, we could literally be going from here to Sydney for a weekend, or if you like cricket as much as I do, I mean, that's an incredibly, uh, you know, it's a, it's a nice thought that I could actually pop across to watch England play, lose against the Australians. Um, anyway, so th that's, that's a, a great thing. But the, the Skylon project, they're going to use this technology to actually get out of the Earth's atmosphere and, and to, to enable uh, flight in the near space region. So uh, as, a, as a father of young, young boys, I mean, one of the things I... 
I often tell them it's my dream to, to, to take a trip perhaps to the moon to see what spring like is on the moon with them to look back at our planet and to see innovations of this category and type take place gives us a bit of hope I think and I think it's incredibly important to to open the horizons to uh, to ensure that future innovators will actually be keep pushing the this is not pie in the sky, to take a pun from the raspberry, but this is technology which of course has been rigorously looked over by the ESA, the European Space Agency, and, of, and is, uh, is shown to be proven to be quite uh, uh, usable. So watch this space. In the next few years, there could well be, you could be all be flying from, from Budapest to Sydney within only a matter of of ours. But innovation on transport systems doesn't have to be supersonic, okay? In fact, it can be something rather less. Here's, here's a bicycle which is very interesting. Um, can I ask for a bit of help from, is, is Gareth here? He's here somewhere? Yes. Can I ask you to give me a bit of hand with this bicycle? I want to show you this bicycle. This is a new British innovation. Actually, transport by bicycle is very interesting. If you, calculate the, if you calculate the ratio of energy in and distance covered, the most, the, most proficient, the most efficient form of transport is the bicycle. Thank you. And here we have this innovative bicycle, which is innovative uh, mainly in that it becomes very, very light indeed. This is um, one of only three of its kind in the world, so I've got to be very, very careful. I, I can, can I sit on it? I've actually ridden it in Prague somewhere. I, I think I've got a little picture somewhere. One minute. That's me, rather embarrassingly, wearing the same suit and tie. Um, also, you might... For those of you who are very attentive, you'll see that I'm actually uh, carrying this bike above my head. Indeed, um, about two minutes after this photograph, there was a, a seven-year-old young little boy, and I, to prove the point, I asked him to come over, and I said, will you pick my bike up? And he, and he looked at me like I'm mad. I said, no, try it. And so he did, and he did. And he was really quite impressed. So this bicycle uh, is, as I said, about 33% lighter, a third lighter than one would, one would might expect. And the reason is, is because it's printed. This is actually, this bicycle is actually, has been printed, or at least, of course, not the, not the moving, not the gears or, or the, the tires, but the, the mainframe has been printed. Now, when you print something, you're really doing a, what's called, what our, our scientists like to say, a bottom-up uh, approach. In the sense, you're going from the bottom upwards, uh, rather than going from the, <laughs> the top downwards. Uh, normally, bicycles are made top-down. They take a bit of metal and they mill it. So they put it into a machine which essentially is chipping bits away until it reaches the design. Whereas this, the design is done in a computer, a three-dimensional design, a sort of three-dimensional map is created, which then feeds into the device, the machinery, which prints out according to that three-dimensional object. So there's no wastage of material, there's no, there's no sort of unnecessary little bits and pieces involved. It's very streamlined in its design and manufacture. I'm going to give it back to Gareth because I don't want to cause any damage to it. It's a very important bicycle. Thank you very much. Now, th this uh, technology is thanks to this gentleman here, Sir David McMurtry. And uh, he has a, a fantastic uh, history. So he, this gentleman here was, used to work at, uh, at, um, for Royals Royce. And he was, in, he was essentially, he's, his, his real, his background is in metrology, so he's, he's interested in, in very precise measurements. And he was tasked, whilst at Rolls-Royce, in very precise measurements of very complicated and very powerful jet engines. Okay? They essentially wanted to know what is the 3D, three-dimensional space being taken up by these various convoluted tubes in this engine, et cetera, et cetera. How to measure and map this out in a three-dimensional way, which was an incredibly difficult task, as you, one can imagine. And in order, indeed, in order to make his task good, he had to innovate. 
And his innovation was this. It's a special probe, which when it passes along anything in any three-dimensional space, it's, the probe is, is, jut is jutted about, and that information is collected, and you can form this three-dimensional, very accurate map of any object that you can imagine. That was his innovational genius. And from that, he then put together the company Renishaw, which, amongst many other things, is printing these bicycles. Now, what I like about this gentleman is his, his, his purpose in, in, that, in his strategy. When that original innovation started, of course, to produce a, a revenue through three-dimensional mapping of anything you can imagine, he then had a, his own personal uh, uh, strategy of all the time continuously reinvesting 18% of revenues into the development of new businesses, or into the development of new innovations, which of course one of which is this bicycle. Another is, for example, using the same technology of very accurate three-dimensional mapping, for example, to, to help with stereotactic neurosurgery. So uh, this, this looks like a, a medieval torture system, but it's not. It's a uh, cutting edge or previously cutting edge, uh, a helping aid for uh, neuro, um, neurosurgeons for making an incision and, and getting to the, an area of the brain which they have to get to without causing any other damage by being very precise. Now, they're now beginning to apply this technology to help the surgeons get a much better idea of the mapping of the brain and ensuring that they can actually get in where it really is necessary. Now, a, a, another, another uh, good spin-off from that is false teeth. Now, um, I don't know about you, but I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that one of the main um, proofs that, you know, we're not designed by, uh, by the big boron chemist in the sky is the fact that our teeth are so badly, badly sort of designed if they were to be designed. I think, um, certainly, teeth often give us problems, they hurt a lot, and they occasionally fall out. And um, I, I would place a bet that 90% of you have had a bad toothache and maybe are the carrier of a false tooth. Now, uh, if you are, then you'll know a lot about the process and the costs involved. They're, you know, they're very expensive, aren't they, to get, you know, get yourself a, a false tooth put in. And one of the major sources of uh, the costs of false, of false teeth, when you have to cough up all that money to the dentist, is the materials involved. And you also, will remember, you also know that you know, at the beginning they, they do all these x-ray measurements, then you have to chew on something, and then they take it out of your mouth, and they make this, this sort of uh, plaster of Paris uh, you know, look-alike of what your mouth really looks like inside, which is terrible when you actually see it. You actually see all the bendy bits and what's really going on, and it's a, it's a terrible sight. And all that work is involved to try and actually map out the area in which they have to fill with this new false tooth. And that's the information which then goes to a company who takes this expensive enameled material and mills it, starts it as a top-down uh, uh, process, of starting with a little block of enamel and then chipping bits away until it gets to the size and the, and the dimensions which it should be. And then you go back to the dentist, they put it in and, you, and they say, okay, does it feel okay? And often it doesn't. Or then they'll say, bite down on this piece of paper and it just feels a bit odd. And they have to often take it back, file it away a bit, put it back in, etc., etc., etc. Prolonged agony, prolonged uh, expense. Now. What the idea here is, this is a good innovation, is they do the, the printing. They can not just print with, with, the, with the metals, but also with uh, enamels, and they can go from bottom up. So the, the, the innovative uh, probe is used to probe the mouth, no need for any sort of plaster of Paris. And on that very accurate three-dimensional data, they can then print the tooth with zero waste of material. No milling in which the material is just lost, however the expense you have to pay. There's the, that, that results in a lot cheaper dentures, which I think is a very, uh, certainly a very pleasing uh, innovation for many of us. 
Whereas many of us have false teeth, um, I'm happy to say that many of us, the majority of us, don't have to um, have a false limb. Uh, and here's a, a brief history of, of prosthetic limbs, you know, starting from something which we might have seen in the 18th century with the pirates until today's rather very efficient prosthetic limbs, which are often cannot be even mistake, can often be mistaken. You can often not tell uh, uh, the wearer uh, is, does actually have a prosthetic limb. And in terms of uh, prosthetic hands, up until now, the majority worked on a, on a pincer mechanism where essentially there's uh, three digits and the movement is just a grabbing, a single grabbing movement. Now, however, we have a, a, a new innovation which has led to a, a prosthetic hand. This is called the, the eye limb, which um, of course it's not plugged in, it's not going to move around for you. But you can see quite clearly from this uh, model that the, the difference is, is we no longer have a, a sort of just a, a hook type pincer mechanism, we've actually got movements now in all five digits, in all five fingers. Now, not, not long ago, listening to um, the rather famous uh, biologist, uh, Richard Dawkins, he had a, an interesting lecture about what he regards are the, uh, the wonders of the world. And in the wonders of the, the world, he included, for example, the spider web, which is an extremely efficient material for the extremely strong for the capture of its prey he also then mentioned the the hearing of of bats and how they are able to use their hearing for echolocation he also mentioned then the the incredibly impressive feat of the the pianist the pianist fingers human beings and their dexterity with their with their 10 fingers the the complication that has a brain has to deal with of independently moving at any one time, maybe 10 digits. So you can imagine it's an extremely difficult thing to reproduce electronically. Nevertheless, people are innovating and getting towards that eventual goal. And this is a big innovative step in the sense that now they've got motion, independent motion in five fingers. Now, I'd like to show you maybe, can we come out of the presentation and there's a little YouTube video. If, you go, if you're interested in, in prosthetic limbs then, and the, the eye limb, uh, that's right, yes. Maybe we can also plug that in. So this is a, a young gentleman who's, who's been one of the first owners of, a, of an eye limb. You can just press play, yeah. See if there's any, I think you turn the, the sound off, but it doesn't matter. Hey, there's, 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 so he's a young gentleman, he's 14 years old, and you can see here that he's um, you know, really become proficient of its use. There's the eye limb itself is, is connected to still functioning nervous tissue uh, in the arm. So the actual uh, control is, is, the mechanism of control is his brain. And there's an application uh, which has uh, all sorts of uh, settings which, can be, which are downloaded into the prosthetic limb, then that's connected to that uh, working nervous tissue in the arm. And then when it's still linked into the app, he can do brain impulses which determine certain movements. So the limb learns from his own brain neural patterns, and so he can actually operate it uh, in, in, that, in, that, in that regard. So it really is an incredible, I think, incredible innovation. Thanks very much. We can put it back to the... To the an in innovation that's helping uh, a lot of people and uh, really improving their standard of uh, living. Okay, so we're going to go through back to, the, back to the prosthetic limb. Yes. One more, please. Okay. Well, I can do that now. Yeah. And what's interesting is this company is not just sort of staying put in this, in this core discipline of these uh, eye limbs, but they're also moving across. They've, they're innovating into uh, what actually covers the prosthetic limb. And they've got a new uh, spin-off company called Living Skin. And you can see here, here's, it's, it's a silicone-based 
uh, in terms of the chemistry. It's, it's silicon-based. But you can see how, how incredibly life like it is and and the indeed you can you can't really tell here there's an owner of a prosthetic limb so uh, this is an i think another uh, beautiful example of uh, british innovation which is no longer not just helping the, the the patient in terms of the mechanisms of movement but also really helping their self esteem through you know wonderful combinations of of mechanics with with chemistry Thankfully, um, the loss of limbs uh, inflicts only a small proportion of, of our uh, global society. But one of the uh, perhaps largest uh, growing problems that our world is having to, to face is uh, diabetes. And again, coming from Britain, we have a, another innovation which I think is of pertinent interest for, for those sufferers of, of diabetes. This is Professor uh, Joan Taylor, who's working at a university in, in Britain. And she's a chemist, in, in essence. And she developed a, a gel that was very sensitive to, its structure was very sensitive to external concentrations of glucose. And this uh, gel structure would open and close, or become more porous or less porous, uh, depending on the concentration of glucose surrounding it. That was her innovation. And I, I, was, I actually speak with the gentleman who sat over there with the hat on, who's working for a company which is, I think is very similar. As a scientist, speaking as a scientist now as well, often you come up with some really good science, but you don't really know how to take it to the next level. And yet there's companies, in this case, uh, the, the, the company is not the gentleman's there, but it's a, a similar one, uh, I think Renvru uh, Group International, and they, they've come along and they're, they're helping uh, Professor Taylor in getting this, getting this innovation, this sort of intellectual innovation, to market. So they're enabling, they're getting it into a device which uses the, uh, the gel that she's developed to monitor, for the body to then to almost self-monitor the glucose levels and to release insulin very accurately based on those levels. So whereas uh, normally a, uh, a, a diabetic would have to measure their own glucose levels with a, a prick in the thumb and the, the, those little uh, machines which, which uh, uh, are able to detect glucose levels, and then according to that, self-regulate a, a dose of insulin, well, in this case, the gel just does it for you. The gel is imparted with, it's in, imbibed with, uh, imbibed with uh, some insulin, and that insulin is released uh, based on the, the, the ebbing and flowing of the concentration of glucose in the bloodstream. Here's, uh, let me just, the box the wrong way around, there you go. <laughs> Anyway, here's what it looks like. So this, this part of, the, uh, this part of the, the whole mechanism would be inserted, of course, into the patient's body in an area where the blood flow is particularly uh, rich and, and, and regular. And the gel inside would be um, imbibed or would be sort of infused with uh, insulin. And the, the gel opens or closes its structure according to the, the concentration of glucose. And so the, the dose is extremely tailored to the patient. The only part which would be external to the patient is this, is this piece here, through which every two weeks you would top up with insulin. So it only required just a, a, a fortnightly topping up of insulin and the diabetic would not have to worry about too much else. Now this is something which is going through clinical trials as we speak and the, right at the beginning, the ambassador mentioned that many of these innovations are actually really going to hit us now, soon, next year, etc. So we can ex really expect, for example, the Sabre uh, uh, engine technology or this artificial pancreas to hit very, very soon. So I hope that's rather exciting to, for me to be able to talk about these things just as the wave. Where's the chap who's walk, talking about the wave? There was a wave, uh, the man who was talking about the wave before. You've got to be just at that crest when the wave is about to break. So I think that's an, a nice further example. Here's another hero of recent uh, British innovation. Dr. Stephen Coulson. And I, if I'm not mistaken, he was 
or maybe even, maybe even still is to a certain extent, uh, he was chaired at uh, Durham University, and he was working on a project which was financed by the uh, UK uh, Defence Department at looking at sort of um, the uh, modification of the surfaces of various military garments, which would make them more or less would make them more uh, make them that make them more sort of water um, water phobic, hydrophobic, so that they can wash it. They if they were have to go through uh, very uh, wet conditions, that that wetness wouldn't get through their fabrics and and towards to their skin, and also would have the added benefit that if there were to be some sort of a chemical weapon used that they could easily wash the entire uh, soldier through with water and it would just run off and it wouldn't have any problem of soaking into the garments itself. So he was interested in modification of surfaces to determine the, the properties of that surface with water. So you might have seen it, you know, you, you, you might have seen, you might have noticed recently in cars how certainly I can remember when I was a little boy in those old cars, how the raindrops would certainly be, there'd be more raindrops on the window screens. I remember counting, I remember following them as they were going down the screen. They'd be a lot more, you know, spread out on that window screen, whereas now they, they tend to be a lot more spherical in, 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 in their proportions. And a lot of that's just to due to just the modification of the surface of the glass, which allows the, the repulsion of these water molecules that just falls down as, as larger droplets. So he was, he's, he's interested in this, and he, he has some great success. He was able to modify surfaces so that here's, here's one, uh, one example. So you've got these two boots here exactly the same. One has been modified, its surface has been modified, and you can see coming out of the water, it's almost immediately dry, whereas the unmodified surface does not have that property. And... Uh, of course, you, see, is you cannot actually otherwise see any other visual difference in the two boots because you're talking about nanometers, so a billionth of a meter. So these are very, very, uh, you know, extremely small uh, adjustments. And indeed, this can be applied, and he is now applying it to electronical uh, surfaces. And he span off from these results of the surface modification, this company, P2I, which is very successful at the moment, trending, and is uh, the uh, receptacle of, of, of various uh, international and national awards for what they're doing. And I'd like to maybe finish, how much time do I have left? Yeah? Well, in fact, I'm going to, so I'm not going to, I need some help here, actually. Can I, there, I think, it, yes, can I ask for your help? I, I've got a bowl of water here. I ask you to take that bowl of water. Thanks very much. I'm going to... Okay. And if you come with me, I've got this... I've got a mobile phone here, which um, has been sent to the company P2, P2i. So they, the, the idea is, is they, they use plasma technology, so they put it into this sort of uh, space where they have a, a very, you know, hot gas, which... Uh, on, a nano, on a nano scale, so a billionth of a meter, and an invisible etching occurs on the surfaces of anything that you put in there. And then while the pressure is very low, in other words, they evacuate the chamber of any air, they can introduce uh, gaseous molecules of an of a organic monomer, which uh, subsequently polymerizes on the surface and forms a protective layer which alters the properties of these systems. So here I've got a, a mobile phone, and um, I'm going to play a video. And this, this phone has been in their, in their plasma system and has been coated with this uh, water-resistant uh, polymer. And... Well, as you can see, the innovation is not particularly innovatively working at the moment. I'm going to have to give it another go in a bit. But <laughs> here it goes. I beg your pardon.
Here we go. Once again. I can't get it to move around. Come on, chap. So. No. It's not going to... Maybe I'll just plonk it in. My fingers are wet. Well, you can see it's, it's working inside there. My fingers are wet, so I can't operate the, the touchscreen thing. But if we go along here, you can see the... the uh, I wanted to show you a nice video, but unfortunately, maybe we can't have it all at this moment. But as you can see, it's quite happy to sit in the bowl of water and not start to fizz and blow up and release lithium ions or whatever. It's happy to stay put and, and actually function uh, in that water. So. And the nice thing about this innovation is not sort of device specific. Theoretically, almost anything can be put into this, uh, you know, this box, plasma box, coated with the polymer layer and become uh, water repellent. So I think that's another rather nice and attractive, uh, useful uh, innovation coming from our British Isles. And with that, I'm going to finish hopefully on time. I, before I do uh, say my final word of thanks, I, I would like to maybe mention three quotes about uh, innovation. The, the first of which comes from William Pollard over 150 years ago. He said that learning and innovation go hand in hand. The arrogance of success is to think that what you did yesterday will be sufficient for tomorrow. And I think this is a key thing, certainly, for my thinking when trying to innovate. You can't, you can't just sit on your laurels and think, well, I've done an innovation. You know, Anna, you know uh, this is great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep plugging away with this innovation forever. I think it shows the dynamism, which is very important, I think, in innovation. Uh, a dynamism which I, you know, I, I wish all of your companies and, 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 and work. Uh, the second comes from the modern day, and Gary Hamill, who's a, a founder of a management consultancy, Strategos, which is a very important one, based in Chicago. He says, most of us understand that innovation is enormously important. I mean, that's why we're all here. We understand. Everybody hears innovation, and buzzers go off in their head that this is important. This is, you know, innovation, of course, is important. It's the only insurance against irrelevance. I think that's really telling you, how, you know, how important it actually really is. One does become irrelevant if you don't keep on innovating. It's the only guarantee of long-term customer loyalty. It's the only strategy, the only strategy for outperforming a dismal economy. Which might particularly be applicable for, uh, for, for Europe now. We really have to be concentrating, which I think is one of the, it again highlights the incredible importance of events like today's. And finally, from the late and great Steve Jobs, innovation has nothing to do with how many R&D dollars you have. When Apple came up with the Mac, IBM was spending at least 100 times more on R&D. It's not about the money, it's about the people you have, how you're led, and how much you get it. And I think uh, the gentleman speaking before, before myself mentioned that working in Hungary, that you, you've noticed that you, you, you actually, you're very impressed by for what little resources, that, the amount of innovation that can happen. So it gives, I think, it gives us uh, hope that even with uh, lower levels of initial investment, that innovation, great innovation, really is possible. And all you need to do is get it. So I hope all of you get it. And with that, I wish you every success and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Bye-bye.